As always, if you're using your headset, your earpiece, keep it in your ear or keep it out. But please don't let it interfere with the microphones. Um, all comments should go through the chair, as always. I do feel that it's going to be a faster-paced meeting, so I would like to maximize your time. I will remind you that the question of privilege related to the member for Wellington, Halton Hills, and other members is why we're here. I would appreciate us staying relevant so that I don't have to be interrupting, and I would really appreciate minimizing the number of comments I have to make. I would just like for us to be able to go from member to member and maximize the time with the minister. With that, we have with us appearing the Honorable Marco Mendicino, Minister of Public Safety, um, and alongside um, the Associate Deputy Minister, Tricia Geddes, uh, from the Department of Public Safety and Emergency Preparedness. Minister, you will have up to 10 minutes for opening comments. I would just remind you to official languages, so maintain a good pace. Uh, for interpreters, and with that, thank you for replying to us so quickly and being here. Welcome to Prague. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Bonjour tout le monde. Uh, first, uh, I would like to acknowledge the presence of my Associate Deputy Minister for Public Safety, Tricia Geddes, and to begin by thanking all of the people that get up every day to protect our country's democratic institutions, the people that work with them, and all Canadians. The security of Canada's democracy is of paramount importance, and the safety security of our national institutions is thanks to them. Foreign interference has become an increasingly pervasive threat to democracies worldwide. Des acteurs hostiles comme la Russie. Hostile actors like, the, like Russia and the Chinese Communist Party are attempting to interfere with the Canadian security and our national security. But the challenges surrounding foreign interference have become more complex and insidious and are constantly evolving. That is why our government has taken strong action since forming government in 2015. Madam Chair, let me explain to the committee the four pillars that underpin our plan to combat foreign interference. Prevention, protection, accountability, and transparency. First, all good strategies must start with prevention. L'initiative citoyenne numérique. The Digital Citizenship Initiative is helping us to protect our democracy by increasing citizens' resilience to foreign information and disinformation by building partnerships to support a healthy information ecosystem. Through the DCI is the Canadian Digital Media Research Network, which is undertaking activities to help Canadians become more resilient and to think critically about the information that they consume online. Within the federal government, my predecessor, Minister Blair, issued a letter to all parliamentarians in 2020 providing information and resource support to them. And as you know, Madam Chair, CSIS continues to provide briefings to parliamentarians to better understand how to protect themselves and their offices from foreign interference. Second, we are increasing protection. We're mobilizing new tools and resources to ensure Canadians, including parliamentarians, safety. This includes, most recently, increasing funding for the RCMP of $48.9 million to protect Canadians from harassment and intimidation by foreign actors, increase its investigative capacity, and to pro proactively support communities most at risk of being targeted. We're also working with the Sergeant at Arms and the PPS here on the Hill to provide more security for parliamentarians and their staff. And we have recently established a new National Counter Foreign Interference Coordinator, which is being headed out of my department at Public Safety Canada. Third, we are making sure that we hold hostile actors more accountable. La GRC a indiqué. The RCMP has indicated that it had ended the foreign interference activity by the so called police stations 
and has carried out some 100 investigations into this matter. The RCMP will always remain vigilant. My colleague, Minister Joly, recently expulsed, uh, expelled a diplomat that was uh, interfering on behalf of Iran. We continue to use all the leverage that we have as a government to make foreign actors accountable. As you know, the creation of a foreign influence transparency registry, as we have concluded the official public consultation phase of that exercise, in particular, working with and engaging diaspora communities so that we can create this new tool in the right way. And finally, Madam Chair, we know that transparency is fundamental to countering foreign interference and to building the trust and confidence of Canadians. We're taking lessons and recommendations from the National Security Intelligence Committee of Parliamentarians. I've already mentioned two very concrete examples on which I am leading the implementation of those recommendations through the creation of a national coordinator to combat foreign interference, as well as the creation of the foreign influence transparency regime, as well as NSIRA, and most recently the work that was completed by the Right Honourable David Johnston in his first report, a report that does lay out a path forward to continue through a public exercise the engagement of Canadians so that they better understand how it is our national security establishment is equipped to fight against foreign interference. Our government and our national security agencies being more open than ever about the threats that we are facing is the best way to protect and strengthen our democracy. But of course, Madam Chair, we know that foreign interference has an impact well beyond our elections and elected officials. All facets of Canadian society need to be protected from this potential threat. Madam Chair, when individuals in Canada are subjected to intimidation, harassment, or manipulation by foreign states or their prox proxies, these activities are a threat to our sovereignty and to the safety of all Canadians. They will never be tolerated, and law enforcement will independently take the appropriate actions that are necessary. With several federal by-elections fast approaching, the Security and Intelligence Threats to Elections Task Force has been activated to ensure the protection of our electoral processes. When it comes to our economy and society writ large, we know that academic institutions, energy and techno technological sectors, and many others are a vector for this threat. Madame la Présidente, Madam Chair, all these measures and all of, the, all, all of these investments are aimed at prevention, protection, accountability, and for uh, transparency being our four pillars that I mentioned. We want to avoid partisan politics in this. Everyone has a moral obligation to ensure the, that we deal with these matters and protect our citizens and uh, the parliamentarians' rights. Such as foreign interference and disinformation. But I want to reassure all members of this committee, in Parliament, and indeed Canadians, that our government will continue to take all of the steps that are necessary to mitigate those threats to our national security landscape, including by tackling foreign interference. Thank you. Merci. Thank you, Minister. We will enter into six-minute rounds, starting with Mr. Cooper, suivi par Monsieur Frugis, puis Madame Michaud, et then Mrs. Blaney. Mr. Cooper, six minutes through the chair. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Associate Deputy Minister, for appearing this morning. Uh, through you, Madam Chair, to the Minister, the Director of CSIS, when he appeared at committee on Tuesday, confirmed that the issues management note of CSIS that warned that MP Chong and his family were being targeted by the Beijing regime uh, was sent to the Deputy Minister of Public Safety. What happened once it, once it reached the Deputy Minister? Madam Chair, I want to thank my colleague for the question. Uh, I think, as you uh, said, uh, Mr. Cooper, uh, you heard the CSIS director indicate uh, his intentions about that memo. You also heard very clearly 
from my predecessor, the public safety minister at the time, Minister Blair, say that he did not receive that memo. What I can assure you, Mr. Cooper, and to the members of this committee, is that through the ministerial directive that I have uh, recently signed off on, uh, that we have strengthened minister, uh, the ability minister, of elected officials to be briefed on these it, issues. That's fine. Just say you can't answer it. What happened once the memo reached the Deputy Minister of Public Safety? What I can tell you is uh, very clearly the intention of uh, the, the CSIS director uh, and the fact that uh, Minister Blair did not receive that memo, but that has been addressed through the ministerial directive sent, that I have was implemented. Sent to your deputy minister, so have you uh, instructed your department to an, an open an investigation to find out what happened to that memo once it reached public safety? Yes or no? Uh, Madam Chair, uh, we have addressed this issue through the ministerial directive, which requires CSIS to, brief, uh, to directly brief me where there is foreign interference in parliamentarians as well as the Prime Minister. So I take it from your answer that the answer to that question is no. So uh, for you, Madam Chair, Minister, when you last appeared before this committee on April 27, you said unequivocally and without qualification, quote, the RCMP has shut down the so-called police stations, close quote. We now know that that isn't true, at least as of April 27th, when you appeared before this committee. The Beijing United Front Work Department organizations that host two illegal police stations in Montreal have said that no action has been taken against them. Jody Thomas, the Prime Minister's National Security and Intelligence Advisor, told this committee on June 1st, when asked how many illegal police stations are still operating, she answered, quote, we are aware of two in Montreal and work is being done to ensure that they cease to operate, close quote. That means they were still operating as of June 1st, contrary to what you said on April 27th. Why did you tell this committee the opposite of what is true? Uh, well, the first thing I, I want to uh, make abundantly clear, Madam Chair, and to members of this committee, is that the RCMP have consistently said that they have been on top of this issue by disrupting foreign interference activities in relationship to the so-called police stations. Now, Madam Chair, as you know, that does not mean that there may not be future efforts. But I am confident that on the basis of the authorities and the resources that we have provided to the RCMP, they, they will be vigilant. And you've heard most recently from Commissioner Duhame, who appeared before this committee himself, to confirm that the foreign interference activities in regards to these uh, so-called police stations will continue to be disrupted uh, in a timely way. Minister, with the greatest respect for you, Madam Chair, you can't talk your way out of this. You made a statement on April 27th. You didn't provide any qualifications. It was an unequivocal declaration that all of the illegal police stations were closed. Jody Thomas, when she appeared before this committee, contradicted exactly what you said. And I did listen to the RCMP when they appeared before this committee uh, two days ago. And upon pressing the RCMP, they appeared to acknowledge that at least one of these stations is still operating and an investigation is underway with respect to the other uh, in Montreal. So you provided this committee with inaccurate and incomplete information in what I would submit with the greatest of respect was a deliberate attempt to mislead this committee and mislead Canadians about illegal police stations operated by Beijing on Canadian soil. Respectfully, Minister, how can anyone believe anything you say? I stand by my statements before this uh, committee. The RCMP have been clear and consistent in regards to these foreign activities uh, in relationship to the so-called police stations. Uh, Madam Chair, I encourage all members of this committee uh, to continue to listen to the RCMP because they are providing timely, accurate uh, briefings. They carry out those operations in a manner that is uh, independent from the government, but I am confident that the government has provided the RCMP with the tools and the resources and the authorities that are necessary Thank to you. deal with these Thank you for foreign, that. Uh, Minister, foreign interference you, activities. You misled this committee, and that's, the fa that's a fact. And I would submit no one can, can believe anything you say. How many arrests have been made in connection with Beijing's illegal police stations? Just a number. M Madam Chair, I'm uh, pleased to reiterate what Commissioner Duhame told this committee just uh, a couple of days ago, I believe, which is that they uh, are advancing approximately 100 investigations question, in regards to foreign interference. How many have been made? You know the answer to that, Minister. The fact that you're unwilling to say it, I think, speaks volumes 
to your unwillingness to come here and answer straightforward questions. So how many have been arrested? Uh, Madam Chair, a, a couple of points because I want to be responsive uh, to, uh, to my colleague's question. Uh, first, the fact that there are 100 investigations the, the ongoing reflects zero. how serious zero. this is. But second, zero. the so fact that the... I'm going to pause. I'm going to pause because, you know... Mr. Cooper, I was actually going to give you the floor back because the beep, beep, beep went off. I'm like, oh, he's kind of hearing what I'm saying. It's taken a bunch of meetings, but we're getting there. Awesome. High fives. I'll throw you back the floor, get you to get one more question, and we go on our way. We hear the beep, beep, beep. You know what my reaction's going to be, and then it's almost like you like it. Um, so with that, I find that odd, but <laughs> everyone got the show. We feel better. Great. Um, can I? Minister Mendocino, the floor is yours, and then I'll be going to Mr. Fergus. Th thank you very much. I'll, I'll try to be concise in my response, Madam Chair. First, the fact that there are 100 ongoing RCMP investigations into foreign interference shows they're taking this matter seriously. If there are arrests, obviously they will be uh, um, updated by the RCMP. But lastly, let's not underestimate the value of the ability and the capacity to disrupt those activities, which is precisely what the RCMP has done in regards to the so-called police stations. Thank the number you. is zero. <laughs> wow. Mr. Fergus. Mr. Fergus, thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, Minister, for being here before the committee today. My question. Uh, regarding uh, the police stations, we had the RCMP uh, come here uh, and they had testified that they have disrupted uh, the illegal activities at these uh, locations. Uh, but they added a, an important caveat. The caveat was that these buildings and locations still are there and that there are other activities which are perfectly normal uh, and, and perfectly appropriate that go on at those activities. So uh, to say that we've shut them down would be uh, an overstatement. It would be to say that those activities have been shut down. Do I have a correct reading on that, Minister? And do you have anything further to add on that? It's, it's very important to make the clarification that foreign interference activities in regards to the so-called police stations uh, refers to the activities themselves. Uh, and I would add something else, and that is the resources that we are giving to the RCMP through budget 2023, as I said, uh, roughly $49 million, is a way in which we can be sure uh, that we can better protect uh, Canadians, and specifically diaspora communities who are often the target of foreign interference activities. So, uh, Mr. Fergus, what I would say uh, through you, uh, Madam Chair, is that it was disappointing to see that Conservatives did not support Budget 2023. Uh, they often talk tough on national security. They talk tough on foreign interference, but they voted against a budget which would have given the RCMP additional capacity to deal with the very foreign interference activities that you're talking about. And they've also voted against other authorities that have uh, would equip our national security establishment with additional tools to fight foreign interference. Minister, as a, a follow-up to that, what what are the challenges uh, that you have in confronting, or, or, or sorry, what are the challenges that you have with, with folks conflating the nefarious activities of the police stations uh, with these community centres? Madam Chair, uh, that's an important question uh, because uh, the geographic locations where uh, the so-called police stations are located uh, attract people for, you know, totally legitimate purposes. So they could be going to the same um, space uh, to participate uh, in extracurricular activities or to be getting other essential supports. And it is uh, you know, my assessment that that is uh, one of the challenges that, that, that is presented, is just really distinguishing uh, what, what are legitimate activities from potential foreign interference activities. But I think we need to be very sober about the reality uh, that the PRC is deploying a wide array of tactics when it comes to foreign interference, not only uh, through uh, the so-called police stations, but equally uh, through our economy, uh, through our academia, uh, through you know, other uh, attacks on our democratic institutions, which is why uh, the way in which I structured my opening remarks uh, lays out the plan, the plan that is based on prevention, protection, accountability, and transparency. So the additional tools and resources that we as a government have put into place are all about advancing that plan so that we can tackle foreign interference. Minister, as, as you're surely aware, uh, we have had substantial uh, 
testimony, which uh, speaks to uh, the, the, frankly, the information breakdown that has happened amongst our uh, security and intelligence uh, information sharing and the lack of coordination in that regard. What uh, is your department, what is the government doing to rectify uh, uh, these snafus? Madam Chair, that, that too is a critically important question. And, uh, you know, as the Minister, I'm responsible and accountable for uh, my office, for my department, and the agencies that report to me. And it is important to identify where the challenges have been around information and intelligence flows. So in my job as the Minister of Public Safety, by identifying that issue, uh, I believe that we have begun to address it through the issuing of a new ministerial directive. The point there is that where there is foreign interference uh, in relationship to parliamentarians, I'm now to be directly briefed by the service so that we can be sure uh, that the issue is being uh, addressed, so that we can uh, be upfront with Canadians about how it is that we're doing that work. I would also say that uh, Mr. Johnston's first report, a report that is very substantive, that is incisive, does uh, lay out an additional number of steps in which we can continue to strengthen our internal governance uh, when it comes to intelligence and information flow, because that is the best way in which the government can take uh, the appropriate actions that are necessary to deal with foreign interference. That's precisely what I'm committed to doing. And a final question uh, to, uh, to you or to the Deputy Minister. Um, I'd ask this question of, of uh, the CSIS director, and, and I'd like to ask it of you. It's, it seems that the framework in which we have set up the structure to respond to these issues, our, our whole security intelligence network was set up in response to terrorism threats. It seems that the frame has changed. Um, how do we now adapt our uh, structures to a deal with these new uh, and emerging, perhaps it's been ongoing emerging, but just a, a new way of looking at, at the, the threats which we face by, uh, by foreign interference now? I'll say a few words and then I will turn it over to uh, ADM Geddes, but I think what your question touches on is uh, the need to uh, think about how we uh, frame national security concerns. Uh, you're right, since 2001, uh, in which uh, in the wake of the 9-11 uh, tragedy, uh, the government uh, put into place a national security strategy. Uh, today, uh, yes, of course, we continue to be vigilant against uh, anti-terrorism, uh, but we also have to think about foreign interference. Sorry, thank you. When the beep goes, we can't pass it to the ADM, but uh, maybe there'll be another opportunity. Madame Michon. Madame Michon. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you for being here this, after, this morning. It's much appreciated. I want to shade, uh, shine some light on the issue around the intimidation of the member for Halton Hills, Weltington, Halton Hills. But first of all, I want to talk to you about your the transparency of what you have said. You have said certain things here, and sometimes in response to questions, you plead ignorance. You uh, s have said certain things in your opening remarks, but uh, you. Uh, in including about transparency, but things are far from transparent. You are the Minister for P Public Safety of Canada. You have the right, the obligation to be informed and to answer a question. You say that uh, you haven't been briefed, the notes were lost, and so on. So how do you explain that as the minister responsible, you should be the first to be informed and you don't seem to have been. Madam Chair, I would like to say through you to my colleague, Ms. Michaud, that yes, as the Minister for Public Safety, it is my duty to ensure that there is a system in place, that information flow is effective effective and strong and uh, well organized and this is why I have taken measures to reinforce measures within my department in that regard. There have been problems in the past but now I am taking measures so that Canada can take the effective action it needs to to deal with it for an interference. Now Madam Chair, I would 
like to ask a few uh, questions, a series of questions, and to show that the minister has said some things, but then other things turned out to be the fact. Now, you said that the police was uh, responsible for emergency issues, and now you're saying the opposite. Now, the Emergency Measures Act was invoked because we had an unprecedented situation, the decision to invoke the Emergencies Act was the result of consultations with the police forces. And this is exactly what I said before Justice Rouleau. Justice Rouleau checked into this, and these were the right decisions. He confirmed that. Uh, my time is short, and so I would like to just have short answers, please. The same situation arose with respect to the so-called police stations organized by the CCP. You said that they had been closed down. Mr. Cooper said, pointed out earlier that that wasn't the case when you had said it. Um, our colleague, uh, Mr. Cooper, asked the question, and I will repeat my answer. The RCMP has taken concrete action to deal with the so-called police stations, and the RCMP will remain vigilant about those activities. You said a few days ago that you were not informed about the transfer of Paul Bernardo from a maximum to a medium security in, uh, institution. You hadn't received information, but we have found out since that you were sent the information. Now, did the information not get to you? How? What is the truth? Mr. Turnbull, point of order. I, I know I was a little bit late getting here, but I, my understanding is we're studying foreign interference today, specifically a question of privilege. Uh, I don't know if this question is relevant. I just, just wanted to point that out and seek your advice on that. I did actually at the top of the meeting remind us that this, I know that on Parliament Hill everything is important and that's why we do like a whole list of important things. One of our colleagues has brought up the issue of foreign interference on a question of privilege that was related, sent to this committee, which I hope I'm never in that position, but I would hope that as an elected official my question of privilege would give the, be given the importance that it needs. So I would encourage us to stay on that topic as well. There's always something more exciting happening. Um, so I'm going to, the time is yours, Madame Michaud, but we are here on the question of privilege related to the member for Wellington, Halton Hills, and other members. Do you want to maintain your question, or would you like to ask a different question? I would like to maintain the question because, and say to my colleague, that Mr. Turnbull, that all of this reflects the lack of transparency and the contradiction. And this is part of the issue with respect to our colleague, the member for Wellington, Halton Hills. When a number of times we've had these contradictions, by the minister time after time, I think that it is part of a bigger picture. How is it that we under learn from the media or from leaks that our colleagues, members of parliament, are the subject of threats and intimidation by foreign actors, including the Chinese Communist Party? How can the, the minister come before us and say he didn't know anything? I'm trying to understand the situation. So I would expect answers from the minister. And I think all of the points that have been brought up today show an important tread. So I would give the minister another opportunity to explain that how it is that these briefing notes are not reaching him. The minister is supposed to be ensuring our safety, our security, and is seems not to be aware of what's going on, including with respect to foreign interference. Madam Chair, 
I would like to thank my colleague for her question. Now, the ministerial responsibility means that the minister has to manage challenges and issues. The, in response to the specific question that I was asked, I have responded to the situation by issuing a new ministerial directive so that all briefing notes will be shared with me and my office, with the government, so that we can take steps in response to these issues. That's my answer. Thank you. Ms. Blaney. Well, thank you, Chair, and thank you to the witnesses for being here today. And I admit that I share frustration uh, with my colleagues and with Canadians about how often it feels like the story is changing from one thing to another. And what I keep hearing from the minister through the chair, of course, is that a ministerial directive has been made and sort of now everything is good. So I guess my my question is, I understand that the ministerial directive was made on the 16th of May to inform MPs if they are being targeted in any way. And I also think it's important that we make sure that everybody understands that if a new minister is appointed, that directive would have to be made again. So it's sort of a short-term solution to something that, um, and I'm not sure that it's actually a full solution, and in fact, it's not, but it is a short-term sort of band-aid to deal with this big issue. So I'm wondering, is there a timeline to move forward with a permanent legislation so that we can see this fixed in a in a comprehensive way instead of sort of this ad hoc band-aid solution, keep finding the holes to the sinking boat, patch something up and hope that it works. I'm just wondering, is there an actual plan for legislation? Um, Madam Chair, through you uh, to my colleague, uh, Ms. Blaney, the, the answer is yes. And uh, certainly it remains the focus uh, to introduce legislation that would create a new foreign agent registry as quickly as possible. I also want to assure my colleague, Madam Chair, that there is a plan, and that plan is based on the four pillars that I outlined in my opening remarks. Uh, again, just to be clear, uh, prevention, protection, accountability, and transparency. And I do agree uh, with my colleague, Ms. Blaney, Madam Chair, uh, that it is important that we continue to strengthen the uh, internal governance around the sharing of information and intelligence. The ministerial directives, uh, they, do, uh, they do succeed through governments uh, and they do succeed through administrations. Uh, and the ministerial directive, which I issued in regards to parliamentary uh, foreign interference, is a way in which we can strengthen those protocols. So, yes, uh, to use your met metaphor, uh, uh, Ms. Blaney, there are definitely uh, waves, uh, but uh, the boat is being reinforced so that we can navigate those waters. Mm. So you're putting together what I see as needing a fundamental change in legislation to make sure that MPs are oriented appropriately, and you're mixing it up with the foreign agent registry. So I just, I'm not clear on how come you're putting those uh, two things together. So I guess my my first question is, what is the timeline for reg, uh, for legislation? You didn't give me a timeline. I would like a timeline. The second part is, uh, we know that on May the 9th, the foreign agent registry um, consultation is closed. When are we going to get the what we heard report? Um, first, uh, Madam Chair, I was very pleased to be able to lead the public consultations on the foreign agent registry. That was an extremely valuable exercise. It allowed us to engage uh, with thousands of Canadians, both online as well as directly and in person. Uh, as my uh, colleague said, Madam Chair, uh, we intend to publish a What We Heard report in the very, very near future, uh, certainly by this summer, and as a result, uh, inform the creation of this important tool. And I would just, uh, again, reiterate that this tool has to be seen against the backdrop of all of the other concrete actions that the government has taken to date when it comes to foreign interference, including by giving new authorities to CSIS, including by raising the bar on transparency through NCCOP and NCIRA. And when we talk about the next steps, including legislation, what you have is a very comprehensive plan to deal with foreign interference. 
So my next question is on the diaspora. We know that there have been long-term uh, communities that have come forward to talk about the challenges that they're facing on a personal level with foreign interference that have largely gone ignored. So I'm wondering, in the consultation process, how did you include these communities? And then in the rollout process of the foreign agent registry, I'm wondering how you're working with those communities to make sure that the rollout is done in a way that is friendly and doesn't target the very people we are trying to get to share with us. Madam Chair, uh, Ms. Blaney makes a very important point. One of the lessons uh, from the public consultation uh, on the registry uh, was that there is fear of retaliation from within diaspora communities if they engage in any uh, public discussion. And so as we uh, think through the next steps on consultation uh, once we table the legislation involving the registry and indeed once we continue to engage Canadians more broadly on the suite of other legislative reforms which may, we may want to uh, uh, visit again, uh, we do need to turn our minds to creating atmospheres which are safe and secure uh, so that Canadians feel as though they can step forward give their best advice, give their best feedback, uh, feedback into this without uh, being worried about uh, targeted or being marginalized or stereotyped, which is the whole point of foreign interference. So it is critically important that we uh, do create uh, those conditions that would, will allow them to engage so that we can bring them along in this discussion, uh, build their trust and confidence. Uh, the stakes are very high, Madam Chair. Uh, what's uh, at, at risk here is our capacity to fight against foreign interference. To do that, we do need to bring along Canadians, and that's our commitment. Thank you. Thank we'll you, now Chair. Go into five minutes to Mr. Calkins, followed by Mr. Nur Mohammed. Mr. Calkins. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, uh, and through you uh, to the Minister. Uh, minister, do you know what an issues management note is? Yes. Is that your final answer? <laughs> I'm jesting. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So already you're ahead of your predecessor, who is now verbally sparring with CSIS over the information um, exchange that should have happened in relation to MP Chong. Um, so prior to issuing your ministerial directive, can you tell this committee how many of your issues management notes you've personally read? Um, Madam Chair, I want to thank my colleague for the question. I obviously briefed uh, routinely, weekly, often daily on issues. Uh, the point of the ministerial directive uh, was to ensure that there's good intelligence, stronger intelligence flow from our officials to the elected uh, branch of government. So we, we feel as though we've strengthened internal governance on that point. So my, my specific question is, you've indicated that you know what an issues management note is. Um, they've been around, according to CSIS, since 2015. My specific question is, do you see each issues management note issued to you by CSIS? Yes or no? I will see issues uh, management notes. They take uh, different forms. Some come directly from the department. Some come directly from elite agencies. Some come directly from my staff. What's important is that there is a dialogue and there is a flow of information so that in my capacity as Minister of Public Safety, I can appropriately uh, be upfront with Canadians about any issue that touches on national security or public safety and that where appropriate as well, I exercise certain ministerial authorities to protect Canadians from issues like foreign interference as well. So in the context of being upfront with Canadians and establishing the, the, the credibility of what's being said here so that we can formulate a report and have proper recommendations going forward, Minister, in January of 2022, you talked about getting advice from law enforcement asking for the uh, triggering of the Emergencies Act, which we found out not to be true. In October uh, of 2022, uh, you had an issue where you misled a federal judge by backdating documents. Um, in January of 2023, you had an issue about the safe third country agreements working effectively and miscommunicating that to Canadians. In April of this year, 
you had to scrap your amendments to Bill C-21 after saying you weren't targeting law-abiding hunters. Uh, in May of this year, you indicated that CSIS never shared intelligence that the communist regime had targeted Mr. Chong and his family, which we now know is not true. In May of this year, you talked about police stations still being open, which is, we know now, categorically wasn't true. And now we know that not only did the Correctional Service of Canada tell your department and your ministry uh, on in, in, in May of this year, but you were also cc'd on that same memo from your own boss who forwarded it on to your department or your ministry and last night reading through twitter your boss and the, through the prime minister's office has said that they sent you that same note and there was no indication according to this reporter that you responded to the prime minister's office and that the prime minister's found, office found out on the 29th the day before you said you found out on the 30th that Paul Bernardo was being transferred Point from a maximum security prison to a medium security prison. It is, it is, Point of order, I, I'm, Mr. I'm, I'm trying to establish credibility of the witness, Madam Chair. This isn't a courtroom, but okay. Point of order, Mr. Turnbull. Uh, Madam Chair, it's the same point of order as last time. I just wanted to ask for relevance. I don't know how Mr. Culkins thinks this is relevant to foreign interference, which is what we're here to study, but I'd really uh, like to know how this is relevant to our current study. So I was, and I will, I was just waiting to see where the question was landing, because Mr. Culkins has been around a long time, so he knows how this works, and I was um, hoping that we were coming back into it, so perhaps that was the case, Mr. Culkins? Back. The issue is the information that's being shared is being blamed not only by you, but other ministers of the Crown as not getting the information. There is no doubt in my mind, Madam Chair, that the minister had the information about this transfer and had the information about all the other things pertaining to Mr. Chong and every other issue I said. So given that, Madam Chair, I'm going to ask the minister if he can do the one thing that I think he knows he should do. He has a microphone in front of him right now. With all of the issues uh, that have been caused under his watch and the issues specifically pertaining to my colleague, Mr. Chong, will he do the honorable thing and resign right here, right now? Madam Chair, I'm focused on one thing and one thing only, and that is doing my job to protect the safety and security of Canadians. That question is so posed with, is riddled with inaccuracies and falsehoods, it doesn't even begin to warrant an answer. Thank you. I will just say when I, because I love watching the House because I'm cool and hip like that, I do believe that we are actually, um, a motion was moved in the House on a similar topic, which means the Chamber is seized with that issue. And here, I would ask that we try to get to a response to the question of privilege from our colleague and to foreign interference in elections. Um, but I can just try. Mr. Noor Mohammed. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, uh, Minister, um, and officials for being here today. You know, I, I came today because I'm keenly interested in the issue of foreign interference, and I've been surprised that we haven't really had much of a focus um, from opposition colleagues on foreign interference. So perhaps we can come back to the issue of the day. Um, one of the things that, you know, in my time as a public servant in public safety at PCO, uh, under three different prime ministers of different political stripes, I recall there was a substantial uh, level of concern dating back to the time of the McDonald Commission around the notion of how do we share intelligence. This has plagued liberal governments, it's plagued conservative, plagued conservative governments, and no doubt we are here having a similar discussion today. So, Minister, when you think about the path forward, because I think one of the most important things we can establish is how do we make sure in context of the question of privilege that we build a safer environment for Canadians, what are some of the things that need to happen in your view or that are already happening um, to ensure that we get right how we address and deal with intelligence and how we ensure that we don't conflate the notion of intelligence with actual evidence. 
This is an issue, Madam Chair, uh, I'm extremely concerned about, and uh, it takes me back to my days as a f former federal prosecutor uh, when I dealt with cases involving national security, and indeed one of the biggest challenges uh, that continues to, uh, to confound not only Canada but many democracies is uh, understanding how it is that we transition from actionable, credible intelligence to admissible evidence which can be used in a court of law to uh, prosecute and hold those who are responsible uh, for committing acts that pose a threat to public safety and uh, national security. Uh, one of the things that the government is very much focused on doing is uh, revisiting that particular question. Uh, and that can be done through legislation. Uh, there are currently Canada Evidence Act provisions that do allow for uh, proceedings uh, where judges get access to, uh, uh, to classified information, uh, then make determinations based on uh, privileges that can be asserted by the government to protect national security, to protect the people that work uh, within those institutions with the, uh, the relevance and the probity of that, ev uh, of that evidence so that they can then be used in open proceedings. I will say, it is a very challenging exercise, and we have to strike the balance correctly. So as uh, you uh, pose the question, and I'm not just talking about yours, but as the government poses uh, that question, we do have to really think through um, the evolutions in the threats to our national security landscape. You, you, know, you talked about coming back to foreign interference uh, in this discussion today. Mr. Nur Mohammed, uh, Madam Chair, through you to him, I could not agree more. The stakes have never been higher. We have to set aside the partisanship. We have to set aside the distractions. We have to be focused on the issues at hand because what's at stake is our democracy, our economy, and most importantly, the Canadian people and their safety and security. Uh, thank you, Minister. My next question, uh, Ms. Geddes, I have had the privilege of working for people who have sat in your seat who are incredible public servants. And so it is, uh, it is always a privilege to ask uh, our senior most public servants um, questions around some of these issues that you live every day. You know, we live in a world right now where we hear all the time, well, if everybody had access to this information, we wouldn't have the problems that we do. Can you just bring us back to why it's so important to distill intelligence in a way um, that allows people to make informed decisions and the r material risks of just putting everything that might be, you know, might be collected in the, in the realm of intelligence into the public domain? So thank you very much for the question. I have worked in the national security community for some time, and I can tell you that one of the most important drivers is for us to make sure that the people that are providing us with that intelligence, and people are putting their lives sometimes at great risk to provide that intelligence, that we are paying very careful attention to how we can take that very sensitive information that we have received and find a way to be able to convert it into either advice so that the government can act on something, so that we can turn it into evidence, as the minister described, or that we can use it for action. But in so doing, those are really important pieces of intelligence that we want to be able to use. But in so doing, we have to be incredibly conscientious about how we're able to protect those people that have, in many cases, put their lives on the line to be able to give us that information. So if you were then to take what you have just said and you consider some of what, you know, what is being discussed in the public domain. And, you know, I'm not asking you, this is not a partisan question. This is a question that I think I would like your answer as a, as a public servant. Do I not have another minute, Madam Chair? No, it's five minute, right? Oh, I guess not. Okay, well, thank you very, thank you very much. Um, I would like you to put Mr. Mohammed, Mr. New Mohammed, do you want to just put your question on the record real quick? Sure, yeah. The, the question I was simply going to ask is, in the context that we now operate in, um, what is the, when you talk about risk, you talked about methods and sources. What are the risks to the way in which Canadians uh, might respond if we didn't take those steps? Thank you. I know, what a tease. This was because um, Associate Deputy Minister Geddes really enjoyed the last answer, so I would love to hear that answer in writing um, because we are limited in time. Madame Goudreau? Madam Goudreau, you have two and a half minutes. Uh, for the third time, uh, you're here, and it's quite a challenge, I know. Is it usual for a Minister of Public Safety not to get the information regarding 
public, uh, so public security and issues? Well, through you, Madam Chair, it is very important that the Minister for Public Safety receive the information about these issues, and this is where I identified with the Deputy Minister where the issues were and what measures we had to take. So I think with the new ministerial directive, we are reinforcing our protocols. And yes, well, Madam Chair, the last time we met was after uh, the uh, budget, and uh, we heard about that, so I'm aware of what you're saying. But how can the Minister for Public Safety uh, not have the information, and we had to hear through leaks to the media uh, that there were these issues. I fully share the concerns of my colleague about the leaks. There is a problem there. But I have confidence in our police services and in their investigations, and the people responsible will be brought to judge justice. But the government can take the necessary action to deal with these intelligence issues, knowing that this, that CSIS has told us that we have ministerial directives and you said at the outset that you want to focus on prevention and you're doing your work, but we are getting these uh, leaks and we see that things are going in another direction. We are undermining uh, our public safety. How can this be? Well, once again, through you, Madam Chair, I, we are strengthening not only our protocols, but our agencies are working to prevent leaks in the future. We have had very good exchanges within my department. Perhaps the Associate Deputy Minister would like to add a few, a few words. Uh, I would just want to ask you honestly, do you feel that you have uh, you failed at that point and that you are trying to come back from that? I am doing what is necessary to protect our safety. Thank you, Chair. Sorry, I was listening to the interpretation, so I almost missed my name. So I'm going to come back um, to the foreign agent registry. I asked a question about how the diaspora would be included in the rollout of that program. Um, so I'm just wondering, could I get something clear that says you're going to have a committee, you're going to have, I, I, I want to get that clarified. So that's question number one. The second question that I have uh, for the minister is Mr. Chong, Chong talked about the defensive briefing that he received. At that time, he had no idea that him and his family, both overseas and here, were being targeted, uh, but he did find it very helpful. So I'm just wondering, is there any movement uh, towards having MPs all receiving some sort of defensive briefing because of how helpful it seems that it was? And how about candidates in future elections? So if you could answer those two questions. Um, through you, Madam Chair, to my colleague, Ms. Blaney. Um, first, uh, I want to come to the uh, question of engaging with uh, diaspora communities. Uh, I, I took the opportunity to emphasize creating safe uh, atmospheres in which we can engage them because of the heightened concerns around retaliation. But I also want to mention two other examples uh, to Ms. Blaney, which I hope will be responsive. One is the National Security uh, Transparency uh, Group, uh, and that is a group in which we uh, seek to engage directly with uh, diaspora uh, and other uh, communities, including Indigenous peoples, as well as the cross cultural roundtable on security. So through both of those forums, uh, Madam Chair, we are engaging directly with diaspora communities and Indigenous peoples. Uh, the other thing I'll just say, and I, I want to uh, turn it back to Ms. Blaney so she can pick up on the second part of uh, her question, if she likes, is that we are working uh, very closely with the service uh, to provide additional support 
to parliamentarians as well as their offices when it comes to foreign interference. You saw in the annual report, which was tabled about a month ago, I want to say, that CSIS in the last year uh, have, have briefed, has briefed 49 of federal parliamentarians. Uh, there's more work to be done there, and that is exactly what we will do. And will it be expanded during elections for candidates as well? Uh, the short answer is, is, is yes, and I would say in addition to uh, briefings, we've also got the uh, reporting protocols that we put into place. So uh, I'm very pleased to work with uh, Ms. Blaney and, and all parliamentarians on this issue. Thank you. With that, um, it comes to the end of our time together, and we wish you a good day, Minister Mendicino, as well as ADM. I will just ask if there is information you'd like to share, especially to the ADM. We, uh, please just send it to the clerk, and we'll Madam have it Chair. circulated in both Madam official Chair. languages. Have a good day. Meeting suspended. Next panel. Next panel we have with us... Mr. Daniel Jean, former National Security and Intelligence Advisor to the Prime Minister. Thank you for coming back. A, uh, Mr. Michel Juno Katsuya, former Chief of the Asia Pacific Unit, Canadian Security Intelligence Service. Um, Mr. Juno Katsuya, I'm going to pass you the floor and then I'll head to Mr. Jean after. Welcome back to PROC. Thank you for responding so quickly. Thank you very much, Madam President. Bonjour, Monsieur, Madame. Good morning, everyone. I'm. I don't have a text, and so I am apologizing to the interpreters. I will be relatively brief. I am following up on testimony that has been given this week by the RCMP and CSIS. Two problems have arisen that are relevant to the issues we are dealing with today. First of all, communication problems both horizontally and vertically. And what I mean by that is that, yes, there are communication problems between the agencies, despite the politically correct language and responses given by our officials. There is information that doesn't circulate properly. And if uh, the information isn't uh, provided, then you can't blame those that don't receive it and vice versa. Then there is the issue of vertical communication, that is, information going from the agencies to the minister's office or the minister. And this is another type of problem that we have to deal with in order to improve the transmission of intelligence and the problems we're dealing with today. Then we have the concept of intelligence to evidence, that is, information that actually becomes evidence. And this is a problem that has existed since the creation of CSIS, which was created for the wrong reasons from the beginning. And I was there. Our marching orders were that we should never be in a situation where we would have to appear as witnesses. But there are a number of issues that have uh, led to situations where that was problematic. For example, the uh, Air India situation, the uh, Shakawi situation, Jeffrey DeLille, and so on. And as a result, the RCMP could not carry out its activities the way it should have. It's not the RCMP's fault. If the information comes from CSIS and the RCMP has to testify in court, then the sources of the information have to be raised, and that is something that is to be avoided at all costs. And so where Air India was concerned, for example, there were people who paid the price for that. So those are two major factors that I believe we need to take into account when we're looking at foreign affairs, uh, foreign interference. Going at lib here, uh, but uh, please do not hesitate to ask me a question in English. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, thank you. So we welcome either of the official languages. So 
never hesitate to speak whatever language comes to mind, especially when there is several in the head. Um, so we welcome both the languages here. Donc, en français, c'est toujours bienvenue, même si You are welcome to answer questions in French or to speak in French. Mr. Jean. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm just going to, I'm going to, there we are. I didn't want to hear the interpretation. Thank you, Madam Chair, for the invitation. Thank you to the members of the committee. I did have decided not to provide opening remarks because I was here in mid-April and you heard my remarks and my answers to questions and I think you have a good idea of my views. I believe, for example, that this is a much larger issue than we have looked at. In my view, one of the greater concerns remain uh, surveillance, intimidation, and harassment of diaspora. Interestingly, since my appearance, you've seen a lot of people from communities coming and talking about this, and we've also seen uh, at least uh, information suggesting that it also targeted a uh, member of, uh, of, of uh, the parliaments, which is a very important thing from a democratic standpoint. So I will leave it there. I'll be happy to answer all of your questions. I think that as much as we want to go through what we, we need to focus also what needs to be done, strategy and actions. In this context, I hope at some point during the question today, one member, whatever party, I don't mind, is going to ask me to talk about the Australian experience because I have a lot that I could share on that on how you move from major concerns to action and strategy. Merci. Uh, thank you to you and good news. Even if somebody doesn't ask you, if that's information you think should be relevant to this committee, please just send it to the clerk. We will have it translated in both official languages um, and I can assure you that members actually are um, well informed. So any insights you'd like to provide, we welcome that. Um, I'm going to go to Mr. Cooper, followed by Mr. Turnbull, Prima Dame Goudreau, and then Mrs. Blaney. Something that has changed since your last appearance is that when it comes to the headpiece, the earpiece, either we ask that you keep it in your ear or to the side. When it's near the microphone, it causes a feedback loop, which causes a horrible sound in the uh, ears of interpreters. So either the earpiece in the ear or to the side, but preferably not fidgeted with near the microphone just in case that happens. Okay, Mr. Cooper. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you to the witnesses for returning to committee. I'm going to ask uh, my questions to Mr. Jean through you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Jean, since you last appeared before this committee on April 18th, you met with the Prime Minister's rapporteur, David Johnson, and at pages 22 and 23 of his report, uh, he confirms that you are the author of a 2017 PCO memo to the Prime Minister uh, that had been reported by Global News. I'm going to ask you some questions arising from Mr. Johnson's findings. Uh, did you prepare the memo at the request of the Prime Minister's Chief of Staff, Katie Telford? So... First of all, let's maybe uh, try to clarify what has been reported in the media versus what is the memo that I sent, and I think the Rapporteur General did that also in his report. Uh, the uh, reports by Global News, according to what the Special Rapporteur have said, uh, refer to a draft of that memo, an earlier draft version uh, that would have been leaked. Uh, the Rapporteur General, I've had a chance to see that draft. I have not had the chance to see that draft. Now, the one thing that has changed since I've appeared in mid-April, I've had a chance to see my June 20, 2017 memo. And also because it's been made public that I'm the author, I can at least talk about the fact that generally what was in the note, although I cannot talk about the classified information itself. So um, I was the author of the June 2017 memo that was sent to the Prime Minister, but the author, the final author, the person who signed the memo, yes. Did you prepare any of the drafts? I would have, well, I would have seen some draft, right? It's always the, the way it works, and you see some earlier draft, you make corrections, it returns. I cannot say whether I've seen the draft uh, of Global because I've had no access to it, and I don't see all earlier draft too, so. The Prime Minister's Chief of Staff, Katie Telford, asked you to prepare the memo. 
I have no real recollection of a request being made to me for a memo by the Chief of Staff. That doesn't mean that it was not the case. It could have happened in the context of they have a regular briefing with the International Intelligence Assessment Secretariat. Maybe they'd ask uh, for, for, for that. That's possible. But to me, no. No. So your answer is no, she did not request that you prepare the memo. Me, no. But as I said, that does not mean that the initial request may not have come to the Intelligence Assessment Secretariat, who do regular briefing to the Chief of Staff and at the time the Principal so Secretary. Who was the point of contact mm. that resulted in your involvement in the memo? We have, there was a number of reasons, as I said, I can talk generally about the memo. So there was a number of reasons why we wanted to do that memo. We were more and more concerned on uh, some of the activities by China. Uh, I've said here that before at my last appearance, we, particularly we were very concerned at that time about economic security, China trying to uh, acquire sensitive technologies, and it is actually a good case today where this country has acted very responsibly, and, and we've seen as one of the countries that has sharpened quite a bit its instruments when it comes to uh, protect or sensitive technology and all that. I can say more of that in others. We were, I've, I've mentioned in my last appearance that in, before the election of 2015, I was Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs, we had issued a notice to diplomatic missions to stay out of election. We were seeing growing concerns that at the local level, uh, maybe some foreign state actors were trying to connect with people. We were concerned about our research. We were concerned, as you probably remember at the time, there was a huge thank corruption. You, thank you, Mr. Yep. John, and I apologize for yep. interrupting, but my time is limited. Yep. And following up on where you more or less left off, uh, Mr. Johnson states in his report that an earlier draft of the memo contained language similar to what was reported by Global News on February 8th, namely that Beijing operatives were, quote, assisting Canadian candidates running for political offices, close quote. Uh, Mr. Johnson uh, states, however, that, quote, the draft was significantly revised before the memorandum went to the Prime Minister, close quote, and that language specifically warning of Beijing had been removed. Who objected to the initial warning about Beijing assisting Canadian political candidates? First Who of all, I've not seen the draft memo that Global assumed to have seen. In fact, Mr. Johnson seemed to have seen a different draft than what uh, Mr. Cooper reported on. Secondly, uh, the note that I send warn about all kinds of foreign interference activities by China, so therefore there were certainly no objections in sensitizing the government. In fact, one of the main reasons for the note, in, on top of trying to sensitize the government that we needed to be very conscious, was we had had the U.S. election. A lot of the focus was on cyber foreign interference, and we wanted the government to understand that whatever tools we were going to develop needed to be as effective to fight analog foreign interference. And in fact, what were the tools that were adopted after, the special task force, the protocol and all that, apply as much as on cyber foreign interference as they do on um, analog. Well, Mr. Did, did anyone, so you have, you, you did sign off on the final memo, yep. and the final memo contains uh, language that, as Mr. Johnson says, was significantly revised and that there had been, that, that it was, there was a, a suggestion that it be general, that no single state be specifically identified. Why? Mm, no. First of all, that's not what the Rapporteur General report says. It says that whatever actions you take, we should be careful. He was talking if you take actions. In terms of the memo, the memo was very clear that we were concerned about growing activities of foreign interference by China. Do it. Don't do it. So In fact, you. the first question that the Chief Counsel, the Rapporteur, told me is your memo is quite clear. Excellent. Thank you for that answer. Mr. Turnbull, six minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thanks to the witnesses for being here today, and welcome back. Um, as the saga continues in this work, it's important work. It's great to hear from you again and have your expertise in the mix. Mr. Jean, I'll start with you um, with a question. Uh, you've obviously read um, the Right Honourable David Johnson's first report. Do you agree generally with the findings in his report? Uh, generally speaking, I agree with the findings, yes. Thank you. Well, generally, I don't agree with all every specific marketing, but in generally speaking, yes. 
Okay, thank you very much. Um, in terms of, I think you, you mentioned uh, previously that uh, a lot of the focus uh, going back years was on um, red flags that were raised, I think, in the uh, U.S. Uh, election and a lot of the interference that was happening sort of, I think, raised the, the threat level for, for Canada. And, and you mentioned cyber interference or disinformation. Uh, was that primarily coming from Russia? That was primarily coming from Russia. In parallel, we were very concerned about a number of things from China, economic security I mentioned. You have to remember that at that time, Xi Jinping was leading a major anti-corruption campaign. Some people were arguing that some of his targets were more like political rivals. And we wanted to be very clear that China should not in any way try to pursue uh, actions in Canada in trying to pursue what they said they, they had fidgeted. So we had a number of conversations with China as well on the importance of going through normal uh, channels. There, there's no doubt that uh, China has uh, been the main focus of a lot of our discussions on foreign interference. But I note that CSIS and other reports uh, that have come out for numerous years have identified other state actors that are uh, also trying to interfere in, in Canada's activities and democratic institutions. M Mr. Jean, I'll go to Juno Katsuya in a second, but um, I wanted to know whether you think any public process moving forward, whatever form it takes, should take a comprehensive approach to foreign interference and include those other state actors. So, first of all, on the issue of other state actors, I mentioned that in my April uh, appearance that indeed there's other countries, particularly when it comes to surveillance and intimidation of uh, diaspora. And on your second question, absolutely. I think it's time that we focus on the diagnostic of the problem, the actions that need to be taken, and whatever process that we do to go in and put, shed some further light on this should not, in my view, delay further the actions that need to be taken. Mr. Uh, Juno Katsuya. Uh, what do you say to that? Should our, our approach in whatever public process uh, is the way forward, and that's being decided, I'm sure, and negotiated in terms of what that looks like, but should it be comprehensive, including other state actors, including uh, Beijing, but also including other countries? Well, definitely we need to be able at this point to, at the same time, educate the general population, and that would be one of the, the aim of one of the purpose of this uh, uh, general inquiry. Uh, at the same time, uh, a fair amount of knowledge has been accumulated through various committee. Over 350 uh, uh, witnesses came in front of parliamentary here to testify at various level. Uh, <clears throat> I think we have a good understanding of what's going on, but I will uh, agree with Mr. Jean that the urgency of going into action and, and coming out with some uh, clear action, because the price that we have been paying now collectively is tremendous. Uh, the people are losing trust in our elected official. They're losing trust in the leadership of this country. They're losing trust in the institutions. Mm -hmm. and, worst, and, 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 and worst of all, also our allies are losing trust Thank in you. our ability to to, to fix the problem. Thank you. I know last time, uh, Mr. Juno Kutsuya, uh, that I asked you about uh, Prime Minister Harper because you've made comments about how many of these threats go back over 30 years and that every government has been influenced or compromised in some in some respect. I, I, and you, you said uh, that PM Harper had become Federal soft Reglement on China. Président. What I'm interested Federal in today Reglement is whether there's... Point of order. Yeah, Madam Chair, I would like to question the relevance of the colleague's question because we're here to deal with uh, uh, our colleagues uh, in the intimidation campaign against our colleague. Because in the first session, so I would always encourage relevance, but we did expand the question of privilege to include foreign election interference. Actually, it was a motion presented by... Um, conservative colleagues. So as long as it's within the realm of foreign interference, I do find relevance, but I will always encourage people to stay on topic, please. Um, Thank you, Madam Chair. And it is relevant. Uh, foreign interference uh, has been longstanding. <coughs> Mr. Juno Kitsuya has, has mentioned that. Uh, PM Harper in 2014 signed a 31-year trade deal with China, and I wanted to ask you about whether 
there were concerns expressed at the time. There was reports in the media. I was just looking at some of the reports back then from national security and intelligence experts that flagged that as a real concern. Has that um, um, had an impact on Canada's national security and in terms of our trade relationship, has it put us in a vulnerable position in any way? So I'll go to you uh, first, Mr. Juno Katsuya, and then to uh, Mr. Jean. I agree, that, and I did state, and will repeat again, that since Mr. Mulroney, every single Prime Minister uh, have been compromised one way or the other. Uh, either it's inner circle or, or and, and, and led to uh, decisions that were questionable in terms of the interests of Canada. Uh, and we accuse or we impute this to the agent of influence that succeeded in gaining access to the decision process. Uh, so, yes, Mr. Harper is, quote-unquote, guilty of that uh, mis, uh, mis, uh, uh, wrong decision, but he's not the only one, unfortunately. Uh, and that's why this is, it is so important at this point to tackle this issue uh, as, we, as we all do collectively as we speak. If I may just follow up on that, though, I want to ask you specifically about FIPA and, and the trade deal. Did that compromise Canada's national security in any meaningful way in terms of China being able to interfere? Mr. Jean, maybe I'll we'll point that one to you. Um, I'm going to actually... Um, give me the same if it's lenience. a one-word or one word answer, I can give it to you, but otherwise I need to go to the next round. Mr. Jean? In... You have to remember that it was signed and it took two years before it was ratified and some of the national security concerns were very much at play. But in all our trade deals and our FIPAs, we always protect our ability to be able to do national security reviews. Other countries have made mistakes not doing that. We have not made that mistake. Thank you. Madame Goudreau. Madame Goudreau. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I want to take the time and I want to first thank you for being here. I want to take this time to be clear that all, with all the expertise that we have developed, we've had over 60 witnesses since the fall, but I don't have your expertise. I am getting a good overview, though, of the situation. So we have heard that there is a clear lack of proper intelligence uh, approach in Canada and a lack of interest. Now, that lack of interest by the minister and the prime minister means that briefing notes uh, fall between two chairs. That's what I've been able to understand. It seems since systemic. Uh, some documents don't get read as a result. And we've just had confirmation of that with our previous witness, the minister. Sometimes we have uh, seen figures showing that uh, that uh, show other problems. Now, does this create a credibil credibility problems for Canada with the five eyes? I wonder about that. And I also wonder whether this is why we have not been invited into AUKUS. I have the impression that there is no doubt. I wonder whether we are well protected. Thank you for your question. Through you, Madam Chair, we have heard from a number of witnesses and senior officials, people in intelligence, that we have excellent investigators, we have excellent operational services, but on the political level, we shoot ourselves in the foot. We have taken too long, much too long, to make certain decisions, for example, with respect to highway. We dragged our feet on that for far too long, and that ambivalence has been shown by other things we've seen here. For example, since the 1990s, there was a report from the U.S., Dragon Lord, that were watching 
the activities in Canada that they felt were being perhaps funded or uh, influenced and that no action was being taken and that uh, compromised Canada's uh, national security situation. So if the 19, since the 1990s, the Americans have been concerned about our decisions, then that is something that I also saw in my work at the Asia-Pacific unit and tried to alert the government about. These problems are longstanding, and they have only increased over the years. We have seen bold moves by certain countries, including China in particular, that have taken much more uh, of a forceful approach to their interference and with the diaspora. Thank you. I would also like to offer Mr. Jean the chance to answer my question because, as has been said, we need to go ahead with strategies and actions. I would talk about the lack of culture and the lack of political interest, because if we look at the reports that were referred to last week, the, the CG report, there's a lack of culture that is highlighted there, but there isn't political interest except when we have a crisis like we have right now. So we need to have more maturity in our political approach. When we look at the current case, there was a problem. We need to go beyond the current problem and find corrective actions to take. When I had a different role. I was the national security and intelligence officer to the prime, prime minister. Uh, and I saw that intelligence that should have caused us to take action often did reach the prime minister and action was taken. The 2017 memo is a good example. We had evidence of China's interference, and we took action to strengthen our election preparedness. Now, you referred to the five eyes. We will never be at the level of the UK and the US because we don't have the resources. But we need to have value added to come back to this issue, we need to make Canadians more aware of the issues and constantly hone our tools. I just have a few seconds left. When I asked the question of the minister to the effect that he didn't seem to be getting the information, is that what you're referring to? Because it seems not all the information gets to where it should. Uh, I was talking about vertical communication earlier, and that's exactly what I mean. Unfortunately, we have seen that some information got to the highest level, but for personal partisan or perhaps misguided in reasons, it was not delivered. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Chair, and I thank both the witnesses for being here today. One of the, the questions that I continue to pursue is the need to see legislation updated. And I'm going to ask both the witnesses this question, uh, but start off with Mr. Jean, because I'll be quoting you from when you were visiting us here on April the 18th. So you did talk about the fact that we haven't uh, reviewed the CSIS Act since 1984, and you said we should have a regular review. Uh, the review should not be about just looking mechanically at the legislation, but bring forward new measures. I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit, um, and that, like I said, this question is to both witnesses, about what we need to be looking at and uh, what pieces of legislation is that we've seen in other countries that might best give us input in this committee uh, to address this issue of figuring out um, the best process 
to assure that members of parliament know when they are being targeted and that they're given the information that they need to not only look after their own concerns, but those of their family members. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair. It's an excellent question. Um, to some extent, the, um, the shortcomings of the CCS Act is at the heart of what you're reviewing right now. Um, when the media first reported on the Chong affair, because of the job I've had, neighbors, people always ask you, and my first reaction was, I have known Michael Chung for a number of years, and if he says he hasn't been brief, I have, would tend to believe him because I think he's somebody of a very high integrity. At the same time, I have a lot of respect for National Security Committee and for CSIS, and I have a really hard time believing that if CSIS had the information that being reported, they would not have taken action. I said, what I'm concerned about is they may have been very limited in what they could share with Mr. Chung because of the lack of legislation. And secondly, while I have a lot of respect for CSIS, go back to my last testimony. Now that the crown jewels are no longer in the government, CSIS needs to change their culture on how you outreach when you have information like that with people to make sure that they have enough to be able to defend themselves. Because with private sector people, when I was NSIA, they would come to me and say, they come and say you should be concerned, but they won't give you more. So you don't have enough to know what posture you need to take. The reality is the legislation doesn't allow them to do that. A foreign registry, that's a good thing. It's not a panacea itself, but no. We should regularly update our national security. We need to ta ta uh, do something on intelligence to evidence. I would suggest that we do something narrow to start with, that we test it. We should work with civil liberties group to make sure that it still offers a fair defense to people. There are a number of things that can be done. Uh, awareness, prevention is very important as well. Okay, and I'm wondering, the minister spoke earlier today about the ministerial directive that just has opened the doors to share information. Um, he seems to think that this is the solution. I think the solution is legislation. I'm just wondering about your thoughts on that. The challenge is that if you go too far, like right now, because of what's happened, everybody is kind of happy with the ministerial directive and want to make sure that member of parliaments can be protected. The trouble is if you go too far with ministerial directive in the absence of legislation, at some point, People or courts will say that you may be out of your boundary. So you need both. You need to modernize our instruments. Other countries update their national security legislation almost on every three, four years. We don't do that regularly. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Juno Ketsuwa, uh, I do have a question for you. You have been to the committee uh, back in May on the 11th. And you talked about one of the biggest gaps, of course, being the nomination process. We know that every party has its own process of how they do nominations. So I'm just wondering, when we look at this and we see that there's a particular gap there, um, and we recognize that there may be a lack of information or a lack of awareness at that party level, how do we sort of bridge that gap? Because it's very important that in the roles that the government play, that they're not seen as partisan. But it seems to me that the parties themselves need information to be able to address uh, these kind of particular gaps that lead to greater vulnerability. And I'm just wondering if you have any recommendations for us on that. Right from the get-go, it's a question of communication and, and to uh, warn the general public or to educate the general public in, in large. Uh, I would follow on what Monsieur Jean has said as well, is that we need to mature as a country in terms of the knowledge of what national security is about and what role every single individual in this country plays in, in national security. Uh, I suggested and I recommended, for example, that for every candidate of any parties, uh, they sign a declaration uh, on their honor that they are not uh, either influenced or under uh, the authority of a foreign state. Same thing for their staff, at the same thing. Because in, if we go just with the allegations or the, 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 the media reports, uh, it looks like that in 2019 there was some people that were on the payroll of a foreign country. So we need to be capable to have this kind of, of, of process because if we do find later that you were lying, you should be prosecuted. Let's remember one thing. 
Foreign interference is not only done by diplomats. Foreign interference is done also with Canadian who helps those people. And what they do is close to treason. Thank you for that. Thank you. Mr. Cooper. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I'll, I, I just want to follow up with uh, Mr. John on my last question. Uh, Mr. Johnson's report says that one of the earlier drafts of the 2017 memo uh, referred to or contained similar language to what was in Global News uh, that said that there was language to the effect of uh, Beijing agents assisting Canadian candidates running for political offices. You said you didn't see that. Uh, that particular draft of the memo, as I understood you. Uh, Mr. Johnson, then at his report, states that uh, it was revised and, quote, this memorandum warns him, him being the Prime Minister, that public efforts to raise awareness should remain general and not single out specific countries because of diplomatic sensitivities. So I ask you again, why was a decision made not to, for example, identify or point out the threat posed by Beijing. Why was the language changed? To so, the note is very clear that we have to be concerned about China, that there are growing concerns. It gives all kinds of ex uh, examples. I'm not going to go into all the specifics. And uh, that in this context, in the work that we're going to try to do to protect our elections, because efforts were underway with the Minister of Democratic Institutions, in terms of developing some of the mechanisms that followed, we should also make sure that we have mechanisms to deal with analog threats like the ones that are described. The, the one sentence that you're referring to, I just want to remind you that at that time, CSIS had not yet started to name China in their annual CSIS foreign interference. It's only recent that we started to name China. The memo invites actions on the way on cyber interference to include, you know, it's not say don't take action, it's just saying in doing that, you may wish to manage the foreign relations aspect of it. Okay, thank you for that, and I will now turn over for the balance of my time uh, to Mr. Berthold. Merci, Mr. Cooper. Uh, thank you, Mr. Cooper. Mr. Jean, you said in your opening remarks or when you answered the questions about whether you were aware of Mr. Uh, Johnston's report and its conclusions. You said that you agree with the bulk of it, but uh, not all of it. Could you tell us what points you don't agree with? I don't think that it is in the interest of what we are trying to do here in the committee. I will be pleased to send you the points I shared with Mr. Johnston about how we can deal with foreign interference. But just to be clear, when I answered that question earlier, what I meant is that we uh, have a report. I was asked whether I agreed with it, and I said yes in general, and uh, there are some things that I might not. Well, I think that is of interest to us because as the National Security and Intelligence Advisor, it would be very interesting to know what you didn't agree with. So I don't have any other questions, but if you could send those points to the committee. The transmission of information is at the heart of what the problem it seems to be. We have heard about that black hole from Jody Thomas, Jody Thomas from uh, others, uh, the information not getting to the minister and the prime minister. If I put myself in the shoes of people that are dealing with the process right now, you worked on a memo in 2017 and a previous version talked about the funding of uh, political activities. We don't know who called for the, mo the memo, who, who drafted, who decides what is in the memo, what you signed off on. Who are those people? Are they political staff? No, definitely not. On your last point, we work as a team. What, what, who's on the team? In my case, uh, the memo for the PCO, 
as national security and intelligence advisor, and I and my team, when we see that there is something that the prime minister should be made aware of or that recommendations should be made about, we work as a team because a political staff member may have seen an intelligence report or briefing note and ask for more information. In I work with my team, and finally, it's the National Security and Intelligence Advisor who uh, signs off. We have to take into account the uh, preoccupations and concerns of that are diplomatic and other. But the question is, why did the note evolve? And there was this other version. Well, if I can just be clear, often the briefing notes from CSIS uh, confused diplomatic issues with political Inter well, with the uh, foreign interference. There might be something that would be an excellent suggestion, and we would sit down with the main analyst for China, and we would look at issues, and one thing might be clearly foreign interference, something else might be diplomatic. Thank you. I just want to say that Mr. Bertold you let Mr. Jean answer, uh, finish his answer, and this is why I gave a little bit extra time. So if we can all conduct ourselves that way, we'll get along fine. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and through you, I'd like to thank the witnesses for being here. Uh, because today's meeting is, is focused on the question of privilege related to the intimidation campaign against uh, MP Chong, um, I understand, uh, Monsieur Jean, you were the NSIA from May 2015 until May 2018. So with respect to the specifics of the question of privilege, uh, you were no longer in that position when this, was hap this specific issue was happening with this specific MP because we understand now from testimony from the head of CSIS that um, the IMU was a uh, came out after sanctions following the 2021, um, February 2021 vote in the House of Commons on MP Chung's Opposition Day motion. So I'm, I'm going to come to the two of you in your expertise as uh, in intelligence and ask some questions, if that is okay. Um, Mr. Junot Ketsia, you mentioned something uh, to answer a previous question. Um, with respect to uh, candidates running who may or may not be loyal to Canada and so on and so forth. Um, as you, I'm sure, both are aware that in June, on June 28, 2017, the National People's Congress in China passed the National Intelligence Law and outlined the first official authorization of intelligence in the People's Republic of China. And that I quote, the intelligence law highlights one important continuing trend within the state's security legal structure put in place since 2014 that everyone is responsible for state security as long as national intelligence institutions are operating within their proper authorities. They may, accord, according to Article 14, request relevant organs, organizations, and citizens provide necessary support, assistance, and cooperation. Based on this change, uh, this legislation, could you give us a, some feedback in, in terms of the change in posture with respect to our intelligence gathering? Because at, we know that the position of the National Security Advisor changed to the National Security and Intelligence Advisor from an OIC dated April 28, 2017. So we know that the question of intelligence was increasing in terms of our, our capabilities or, the, or where we were focusing. Can you give us a little bit more information on how that changed Canada's position and posture with respect to intelligence gathering? Thank you very much for the question, Madam. Uh, First of all, it, it demonstrates the aggressivity that at that point Ch China decided to send as a message. We have to understand sort of the way that the Chinese government functions with its intelligence services, which is almost in direct line with the Central Committee uh, 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 that basically gave the marching orders for them. It sends the message also to the entire diaspora and the, the, everybody who's Chinese descent that you must collaborate if we come to you and we ask you to collaborate, period, uh, which could potentially make a 
you be a traitor to your, the country where you reside to a certain extent. So there's a conflict of interest here that is forced on the people abroad. And that is a form of, of uh, 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 pressure that is exercised on the community. Unfortunately, the understanding of how the Chinese intelligence services, only even how the Chinese government function is still elude a lot of the uh, 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 intelligence Western agencies, in particular CSIS. CSIS has a long, long history of being Eurocentric. So we work for decades during the Cold War on Russia, and we tend to an analyze the intelligence world from a Russian perspective or Eurocentric perspective. The Chinese don't work like this. They work very, very differently. They have time on their hand because the government is never elected. This just stays on. So the operation can last for 5, 10, 15, 20 years. They have no problem. So actually, on that note, we know that according to Hofstede's uh, power index, they're long, they are long-term orientation, which means they will take the, play the long game. It may take 10 15 years to, in, ter in terms of uh, gathering intelligence. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. And that is uh, to our detriment because we need to come out with results very, very quickly. Otherwise, the operational uh, priorities will change. And that's why, to a certain extent, the communities have been badly served because they, we were not capable to accumulate the information long enough. The RCMP have done an excellent work to try to catch up since we've this, this issue have been coming out, uh, and I think they've, they've made very uh, uh, progress, great progress with the community and reaching out to the community, as it was testified also by the commissioner, and I believe what uh, was said. Unfortunately, we're still behind, and there is also a lack of communication between, like I said, horizontally between CSUS and the RCMP. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mrs. Romanado. Madame Gaudreau. Merci. Madame Gaudreau. Thank you, Madam Chair. Two and a half, two minutes. I want to look at the near future. That is, if we think about uh, being uh, the Prime Minister, the Minister, or the Chief of Staff, we just have a few days left before the end of the session. What do we need to do right now and for the future? Immediately, there isn't much time left. We need to prepare uh, and draft a Foreign Interference Act. One of the problems is the difficulty of carrying out investigations against people who have committed reprehensible acts because the foreign uh, the security act as it allow, as it exists is not sufficient we need to do be be able to do more to protect the diaspora populations against uh, intimidation we need to do like the australians americans and the british have done so legislation uh, is there anything else perhaps mr jean has something to suggest i agree we need to go beyond partisanship, and obviously that can play a role, but we need to improve our tools, legis legislation, the CSIS Act, the foreign agent registries. Those are things that what we need to do. The Australians had a lot of foreign interference by China, and they got someone to come to work with the equivalent of CSIS for the Australian government and looked into the various tools needed, like a register, penalties, and protection of elected representatives. I think we could do something like that. Well, in parallel, uh, we can uh, walk and chew gum at the same time. Uh, what about the investigation? We Do you not think that we need a public inquiry? I think that is necessary now because the Canadian 
public wants to see clearly what the situation is and that the government is taking these matters seriously. We need all parties to work for the resolution of these issues as well that is affecting everything. Thank you. Ms. Blaney. Well, thank you, Chair, for that. Um, I'm going to come back to Mr. Janu Kedisa. Um, I'm just, I'm really curious. When you were here back in May, you talked about the chain of command being a roadblock and that CSIS and RCMP reporting goes directly to the PM and often that's where the roadblock is. So when I think of the issues uh, for members of parliament uh, and the realities of foreign interference and what that means for both themselves and their loved ones. And when I look at the diaspora community and what their needs are and the fact that we've heard a lot of testimony of, of people coming forward to talk about specific activities that they've identified that they're very concerned about, often coming forward at great risk to themselves and to their loved ones, it just gets stuck along the way. So I'm just wondering if you could um, talk a little bit about what what this blockage is and how do we get to resolving it? Is that part of your vision around the Foreign Interference Act, for example? Foreign Interference Act is definitely uh, an important element that needs to be uh, given to the law enforcement to be capable to work with. Uh, your question has several layers of, uh, to, to, to be able to be answered. Uh, when we talk about the community, it is our responsibility to protect the community. It is a responsibility for the law enforcement, and particularly the RCMP, to be capable to sort of get into the community, receive from the community their grievance, and being capable to address and hopefully neutralize also the action, the advert ad action done against the community. When it comes to the... Uh, uh, political process, the electoral, electoral process being tackled, we need to be capable also to warn as soon as possible anybody who would sort of be targeted because they oppose to the vision of China or, or more, uh, let's, let's not forget also, China recruited some politician. China recruited some people that work now on behalf of China. They are elected officials. So we talk about the one who are targeted, but we should be talking also about the one who have been recruited intentionally or, or consciously or unconsciously, what we, use, we call the useful idiot. Well, we've got to sort of wake up a little bit here on that notion. Thank you. Mr. Cooper. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair. I have four or five minutes, so I do want to put a motion on notice and then use the balance of my time, if there is any, to uh, ask a question to Mr. Jean. The motation that I'm putting on notice uh, that I think can be t that can be taken up. Uh, I'm just going to pause real yes. quick. Um, is there any way of us getting it in both official languages? Uh, I'm just. It's very short. I'm going to read it into the record. Okay. And it and will be do the interpreters have it? I believe they do. Just because we know that's kind of the normal practice, and on the last time I kind of let it happen, and then I got concerns raised to me. Yeah. So I will just to keep us moving and knowing that we're close, I'm going to let you do this a second time. But in future, I would like you to know that I need a copy to be given to interpreters, and we need it in both official languages. Putting that on the record, and just because Mr. Cooper got to do it twice doesn't mean everybody else will. The expectation is that if you're giving notice of a motion in this committee, I need it in both official languages, and I would like the interpreters to have it. Mr. Cooper. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. The motion reads as follows, that the committee invite Zita Estravas, Chief of Staff, to the Minister of Emergency Preparedness to appear on her own for two hours, and that she be scheduled to appear within seven days. Uh, Minister Blair, I believe, misled this committee when he, in answer to questions around the IMU concerning MP Chong and his family, not only said that he had not received the IMU, but made the patently absurd claim that CSIS had made an operational decision not to inform him uh, about MP Chong and the fact that he and his family were being targeted by the Beijing regime. Mr. 
Blair's testimony was contradicted by the director of CSIS, who said, in fact, no such operational decision had been made. On the contrary, that information had been sent up in the form of an IMU because the fact that the Beijing regime was targeting Minister Blair was a matter of particular concern. Uh, so on that basis, uh, I think it's appropriate that uh, the chief of staff come before a committee to answer questions about what she knows, because uh, in the face of the minister's uh, testimony, uh, it, it is relevant to hear from her, but also on the basis that she also had received a copy of that very same IMU. So the minister and his chief of staff, I believe, have much to answer for. Uh, and uh, as a starting point, uh, we should hear from Ms. Estravas. Now, turning to Mr. Jean, through you, Madam Chair, you, uh, in your opening remarks, spoke about the Australian model. I would note that Australia has criminalized uh, assisting a foreign intelligence service, uh, something that Canada does not uh, have. Uh, do you think that uh, such a step would be helpful in countering foreign interference? And I will give you the balance of my time to elaborate on some of the points you wish to make about the Australian model. I think that what you, you definitely need is there need to be real deterrence. So whether it's through the criminalization or some other penalties that you have if you are involved in foreign interference, uh, when I speak about 2017 and how deep they were in foreign interference, there was a senator who had allegedly uh, shared classified information with China. Uh, they had all kinds of concerns of that nature. So if we're going to have a foreign registry, that's one thing. But if people, because foreign registry will be good for the people who because of their occupations, lawyers and uh, people like that will want to comply with the law. So as long as there's not huge exemptions, as there are other things, it will, be, it will have some effectiveness so people will comply with the law. There are people who choose not to comply with the law. They need to be deterrents. And deterrence means penalties, whether it's criminal, whether it's monetary, but there needs to be real deterrence. That's crucial. Uh, you definitely need to do something about providing more uh, uh, ability. You... On problem number one, with the surveillance and intimidation of, of, of the diaspora, and I was really happy to hear the, the RCMP testimony this week, we need to work with the communities that they feel confident they can come forward. And then when people are taking action, that they're trying to intimidate people in the community, there should be actions taken against them. Uh, and that's critical. In the last couple of years, the work I do, I meet a lot of young Chinese people who say their parents who are dissidents, and their parents say, I'm scared of what you're doing because either us or our family back home is going to be in, you know, intimidated. We need to be able to create space for Canadians who are harassed, intimidated, to be able to come forward. Um, so there's a number of measures. I said I have a document that I'd be happy to share with the committee, uh, but to me, Yes, you're trying to shed more light on this, but please, to all parties, go above partisanship and focus on a strategy that can undermine foreign interference. It is on their national interest. Excellent. I'm going to just thank you. Thank you. There's seven seconds left to being completed in five minutes, but my sheet shows that more than seven extra seconds were provided. So I'll go with five minutes to Mr. Mm -hmm. Noor Mohammed. And that will bring us to the end of today's meeting. Mr. Nur Mohammed. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and thank you, witnesses, uh, for being with us. I, I'm going to ask one question and, and give the rest of my time to Mr. Uh, Fergus. You know, at Ethics Committee on June 2nd, uh, Dean Baxendale, who's the Chief Executive Officer of the China Democracy Foundation, testified, and he said that, and I quote, under the Harper government, a number of MOUs were entered into directly with the RCMP. This allowed some 25 China communist agents, we'll call them policing agents, to enter the country to look at repatriating supposed criminals uh, from Canada. A number of uh, them were deported during that time, about 290. I mean, it would safe to, I mean, it's a safe assumption to make that these MOUs would encourage this practice of policing or intimidating the Chinese community by folks coming from outside. In your uh, opinion, uh, Mr. Junio Katsuya, had the Harper government taken this, uh, the consequence of this more seriously, where would we be today? Would we be in a different place? 
definitely when we allowed the, the collaboration with the police in that perspective, we send the wrong message to the community. That's un unavoidably. Uh, in that perspective also, we know for a fact that during their stay, some of those police officers, the Chinese police officers, went into doing covert meetings uh, with people and they were not supposed to be doing that. It was reported back to the Minister of Public Safety in, back in China through our ambassador and everything. So uh, it is a good example of the misguided policy or misguided decision that are definitely questionable in terms of why we did such a thing. What was the gain uh, of, of, for our nation to allow that kind of uh, uh, pursuit by uh, the authority when we can question the original intention of uh, their pursuit? That is the same thing when certain companies were uh, authorized to be bought by the Chinese here in Canada. That was given by many different uh, prime ministers before. Uh, we have a process with Industry Canada to, to allow na for national security to prevent the sale of certain assets. And unfortunately, it's not, ex it's not used enough, to my uh, point. Uh, thank you. And I'll yield this my time to uh, Mr. Fergus. Thank you very much, Mr. Uh, dear colleague, Mr. Nur Mohammed. Uh, Madam Chair, through you to our two witnesses, first of all, thank you very much. I, I think I have two brief questions if I can get the, if I can get the answer. And, uh, you know, sometimes being a committee is like uh, <laughs> drinking from a fire hose. We get a lot of information thrown at us. And it's sometimes afterwards, that, upon reflection, uh, that I'm, I'm trying to just get a settle of this. Uh, Mr. Juno uh, Katsuya, you came uh, before committee before I believe it was this one. I'm sorry. I've seen you also at, at, at the Ethics Committee on the same issue. Uh, you said in previous testimony that you estimated about 70% of the Chinese embassy staff uh, were spies. Now, for the purposes of this study, I'd like to track down my sources. Can you provide the committee uh, with the source for that figure? Because I've, I've, I've spoken to a number of other, to other foreign, uh, 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 foreign policy experts, and, and they have a hard time putting the number at that high f uh, figure. That, that number came from my experience when I, while I was with CSIS. That, okay. And, and again, you were at CSIS until the years? 2000. 2000. Okay. Um, is it your sense that things could have changed since that time? If anything at all, it might have increased. Uh, if anything at all, the, since uh, in the mid-90s, as I testified before, uh, we, we've noticed the uh, foreign interference coming from the embassy in China when we found in the uh, record of uh, Election Canada that the embassy had given that year, 1995, money to both the Liberal Party and the Conservative Party. We could see that they were preparing the bed for this, this foreign interference. Uh, unfortunately, it was, it was not understood or evaluated enough by CSIS, and we let this go on for uh, decades. And what it, we witnessed, because even if I left CSIS after 2000, I kept working on the file and investigating uh, the file for various uh, uh, clients, uh, we've, we've, we've seen the Chinese becoming much more bold, much more audacious uh, in their way of, of operating and increasing the number of diplomats who are actually intelligence officers. So thank you very much for that. I did want to get a question to Mr. Jean. I'm probably not going to have enough time for an answer, but I'm hoping you could provide an answer in writing, Mr. Jean. Um, it's regarding the Australian model. You talked a little bit about how we should, uh, what uh, practices we should adopt to it. Uh, what are the things that we can, what mistakes can we avoid that the Australian model for foreign, registrants, uh, for foreign registry uh, can, we, can we have? Can we take? I think the I think the foreign registry is one element in a broader strategy, and and we should not oversell it, right? So I would go narrow. I would make sure that it forces people to represent China. It should be modeled on the Lobbying Act. So people are representing interests of China. Maybe be law firms, maybe be others should have to report their contacts like they do under the Lobbying Act. There should be penalties for people who will choose or not comply, who will not report. The penalties should be meaningful, going back to the question of Mr. Cooper earlier. Um, so you need to have good measures. You need measures that are going to deal with what the problem is. And that's why I, when I say I would hope that the committee's work allowed to go above partisanship 
and develop a strategy that deal with what is the problem, what are the best instruments that we need to update, and how do we make sure that we're successful in correcting this thing? Maybe I'm too naive. Thank you. Okay. Um, Mr. Juno Katuya, Mr. Jean, thank you so much for your time today. A couple of times it was mentioned that perhaps there would be documents that would be relevant to members to receive. I would ask that you send them to the clerk. We'll make sure they're in both official languages and circulated around. I also just want to appreciate the fact that I think on multiple occasions it was, well, one time it was mentioned the number of witnesses, over 300 at all committees combined, the demand, well, the ask to go above partisanship because when it comes to our institutions, it is essential that we protect them. We can talk as much as we want on the international stage about in democratic institutions. If we don't protect our own, what does that mean? So I really do appreciate um, the information you provided to us, and I wish you both a good rest of the day. Proc committee members, we'll see you next Tuesday. Uh, keep well and safe. Meeting adjourned.